Welcome everybody. My name is Roberto Zagni and I will be your host in this table. So while we wait for the late arrivals, I take uh, this time for uh, remember you that uh, uh, we will have some 15-30 second delay in the stream. So when you make question, please try to be specific so I can figure out to which slide you were referring or to which part of the presentation. So let's wait 10 seconds more. So we have also the late joiners and then uh, we can start with this workshop. Okay, so welcome again, everybody. Uh, I am Roberto Zagni and I will be your host in this demo. And uh, I am lucky to be here today uh, and work and present you uh, this work with a, a few tools that I really am in love with. And uh, I hope that at the end of the presentation, you will be in love with, with them too. So let's start with a couple of quotes uh, to get uh, a smile and also introduce a very serious question. Data is definitely essential to reduce subjectivity. Being data-driven is what is said in the industry. It is the fuel to power the decision route in reality. But like raw oil, raw data is hardly ready to be used in its natural form. So the question is, do you need data or do you need information? Companies need to refine data into meaningful information that the businesses and operational people can understand and act upon. At Kaito, we do just that. We live and break data. We collaborate with our customers to help them to transform their data into useful information. This is our mission and just about everything we do revolves around helping companies and use, understand their data. Even if we do have our preferences, and some like me are outside in love with some of the tools, we operate in a technology agnostic way, on a broad range of technology, engaging with businesses and technology stakeholders in the best interest of our customers. We work transparently and with technologies that avoid consultant locking because we believe that mutual benefit brings better results than forced collaboration. So our agenda for today is about a fictional but typical use case that we want to use to show you our preferred approach to data platform automation. What we are going to present you is not a dogma, but the distillation of our experience of so many years and use cases together with an informed selection of tools and methods that we see value in and we have refined over the time. From our customer, we get demand for a solution that is flexible but well thought out and without integrator locking. We feel that the time is right to take data platform development from art to industry. We have picked a congruent set of our preferred technologies to build a flexible knowledge product that we are demoing today. The idea is to industrialize the use of patterns and tools that we have seen to work well and bring the advantages that you see in this slide. We like also the agile approach of releasing as soon as you have something valuable and in iterate to improve it. So this is our first public demo about this product concept. We are not yet at the end of this productization journey, but we know this is already a very valuable solution that works on the field. We hope to inspire you and we would be happy to work with a couple of companies that want to jump abroad early, shaping the solution on the field and benefiting 
from being development partner and our experience in the lab developing this kind of solution. So get in contact with us to join the development. The previous slide presented the many reasons for building an industrial strength data platform automation. Too many to discuss right now, you will get bored. I think this is the real beef. We want to produce usable information that satisfies the most stringent enterprise needs while delivering quickly in a world of change, using the skills that are available or easy to nurture or to acquire in an enterprise setting. So in this case, SQL is much more available or easy to get than Python or Spark or Hadoop knowledge. So we want to leverage that one. Our use case today is about an imaginary financial consulting company, but you can judge yourself if the needs are realistic and resonate with your own priorities. The data warehouse at the end of life and Squarebox want to replace it with a more modern data platform that allows them to start delivering results in a short time frame and support change. They have contacted Kaito and we have proposed our data platform automation solution based on software as a service platform and open source tool and standards. Squarebox most important requirement I summarized here. They do not want to wait many months or year before starting to use the new platform. They want to see some pain go away quickly and move towards further goals one step at a time. They work in a regulated industry, so a regulation imposes them rigorous handling of history and full auditability. They also want to leave behind the release mayhem they are used to and embrace a modern pipeline with automation, continuing integration with the automatic testing of each merge into master and one button released to production. They have quite a few people that know SQL in the company, but not many data engineers or developers, so they want to make best use of the skill they have. They would also like a solution that can go and is future-proof. And while they like us and trust us now, they not want to be handcuffed to us forever. They would also like spending being in line with the benefits and avoid big upfront investment that need here to pay off. I hope that this resonates also uh, with what are your needs. So let's get into what we have proposed. So on the left is a square box situation with multiple source system, some internal, some external. Some system produce a data file that are loaded in the cloud and we have simplified the three main. Other system have changed data capture or data loaders that can deliver the data in some lending table inside the des desired uh, database. In the center is the high level view of the solution that we have agreed with Squarebox. Snowflake is at the core. It is the, at least for me, the only real cloud design analytical database. It allows you to have your data in any major cloud and move between them seamlessly. So you keep your door open, that is always a good thing. So we will store there the data and use this also practically infinite scalability to run our workload. We also use Data Vault 2 architecture because it is a field tested, agile architectural approach to build enterprise data platform that embrace automation and make use of best practice and patterns that we find useful. It is not strictly needed, but it provides a, a good and consistent precepts to build enterprise-grade data platform, so we like it. DBT and DBT Cloud uh, are SQL-driven ATL development tool. You describe your transformation with simple SQL, and dbt join the puzzle and runs your ATL. 
It is an open source product with a very strong community. DBT Vault is an open source library for DBT that automates a lot of the work to build a Data Vault 2 data platform. DBT Cloud is a commercial software as a service offering from the creators of DBT. So you can write DBT code, run and deploy pipelines in the cloud. It is optional, but provide great value for little enough money. So we suggest to use it. We don't gain anything out of it. It's just that we think it's really worth the use. And of course, uh, we give for granted that the modern solution should store a code in a version repository that enable uh, best practice uh, workflow around code development and also deployment. Late last, uh, the BI analytical layer, our solution works with any BI or analytical tool. Today we will show something uh, with Power BI, mostly because it's a versatile and readily available BI tool that works well for us to simplify the some reporting built on top of this data platform. But you can pick the one uh, that you like. So how does the data architecture look? This data architecture that we are using is definitely inspired by Data Vault 2, but uh, it is a general purpose architecture that fulfills good software engineering practice. In particular, it assigns clear responsibility to the different components. So it is a very sensible approach, even without Data Vault. The main layer are, of course, this is the source data the data that comes in and is available to our data platform. So the first layer of our solution is this staging layer where we receive and adapt the source data. For example, you adapt the field names or the time zone to what is your standard in your data platform. You can calculate the technical fields like a lot of the timestamp, data sources, and also we can manage reference data uh, like ISO codes or the calendars, and also some manually maintained data like categorization of list of values and so on. Then we have the enterprise data platform properly said. So uh, in our case, uh, organized as a data vault, where we load the source data in safe, extendable, easy to use way that also preserve history. And the good of uh, Data Vault approach is that it uses just three main concepts, so it is very easy to understand even for people that join lately in the development team. And the other two layers, the Business Vault, is where we apply master data management, business rule, and all desired calculation on top of the historical data safely stored in the Data Vault. Last but not least, we have the data mart layer where uh, we provide the data in a format that is optimized for reporting, both easy to understand for the business user and also quick to load for the BI tool. If we take a little bit look uh, deeper into the data vault organization, uh, we can see that the data vault structure make very easy to see the concept and their relationship when we look just at the structural nodes. Here we see that uh, we have uh, two hub, security and portfolio, a reference uh, table, the calendar, and then we have two relations between them. Uh, the daily quote, so the value of a security in a particular day, and the portfolio content. That is uh, the amount of se uh, security own in a portfolio on a given day. Then in the business vault, we provide business policy version of the raw concept stored in the data vault. And they are built on top of this relation and supplemented by the data, the detailed data stored in the satellite. In the data mark, we expose the desired business concept in a BI tool friendly way. So I hope that I have set the stage uh, 
with this uh, example use case. So now let's go and have a look uh, at our solution at work. So this is the plan. So we start uh, by looking at a very simple report uh, that we have created with Power BI. We will notice that uh, we miss some data. And then we will load this data to a REST service. And then we will, of course, run DTL so that the load data is loaded and available uh, in the data table, in the fax and dimension. And then we will verify that the data is actually available both in the data platform and in Power BI. And while the automation work, and probably also after that, because it's not going to take so much time, I will also take you for a walk uh, on how we develop using DBT and also on some of the important features that uh, make a great tool also for the business user and your analyst. So let's get into our Power BI dashboard. So here we see it's very simple dashboard. Uh, it is nothing fancy. We have just built it to show that uh, there is some real data behind it and it's not just fake. On top of this, uh, uh, that symbolize uh, a report dashboard for uh, some, someone that manage many portfolios, we also have built a very simple stopwatch chart. And let's look at some of these quotes. And of course, we see that uh, we have loaded the, the quotes for many symbols, like Apple. And if I want to look at American Airlines, oops, I notice that we are missing data for American Airlines. So now what I want to see is if the data is missing because of some issue in our BI tool, or if the data is actually missing in our uh, data platform. So I will go and take uh, this uh, access our data platform that is in our case for this demo is Snowflake and let's start to look in the various layers. So let's look in the fact table. So we see that we don't have data for American Airlines. We have data for the other and we have all the data for Microsoft but also Facebook and AM, that is until midstream, actually are missing some of the most recent data. And the same is for Tesla. So we don't have there. Let's see if we have it in the data vault. Now, same information in the data vault. And so let's see if we have in the landing table where our external system uh, loads the data. No, we don't have that data even there. And if we look at that, we see that the Facebook data is, there is no Facebook data there in the source system, but we actually have loaded something. And that because we also had an initial migration. And yes, we see that we had the data in the initial migration, but now we will add the more recent data to our uh, to our new service that provide us the stock was right now. And then let's see that we will get uh, uh, all the data. So we need to load data for American Airlines. Let's execute it. And this is a very simple Spring Boot and Java application uh, that I built to export this simple REST API that I can call in this demo uh, to load uh, the data. Then let's also refresh the data for Facebook. So, okay, now we have uh, loaded the data and then let's see if now we have the data in our source table. Yes, now we see that uh, we have uh, up-to-date data for Microsoft, Facebook, and American Airlines. So let's go and finally look at the DBT. And I will go 
to our home in DBT so that uh, I can start showing you how the process works and after we are done, we start uh, the ATL load, I will go and show you uh, a little bit around how we do the development. So in this case here, we see uh, the run that we have. So we see that we have this uh, scheduled job that runs twice a day, one in the late night and one in the early morning, that will uh, refresh all uh, the ATL, will run all the ATL, but we also have a linear ATL job that is this one, that will just load the new quotes. So I will start it now. So now the job is queued and he will start executing in a short time. It usually takes two to three minutes. And so we take this time to go and look at how we develop. So when I go uh, to develop environment, we see that the, uh, this is a DBT cloud. As I said, it is an optional tool. All that I'm doing now here in the cloud with this web-based editor, you can do also on your own PC with your favorite editor, and you can just edit in the end. It's SQL and some little scripting. So what I think is good is that this online version has both built in, if you see master is read only, so a good simple development process where you have to create a new branch. If you want to make a change, you have to create a pull request. And then when the pull request is merged, hopefully you will do like we did, we do, and we, you will be uh, creating an automatic uh, continuous integration job that will uh, run uh, the branch that you are integrating into CI and run all the tests and so verify that you are not introducing any regression. But in this case, I will just use this uh, to browse around and show you how a typical, we organize a typical project, some of our uh, naming convention or basic building blocks that we uh, came to use through experience. So this is a typical organization of uh, a DBT project where you can have some SQL that gets compiled for your analysis, uh, some data that are reference data that you see, is CSV data that you want to load as a, a reference. We also use these to load our initial migration data. And we also use this to simulate an import from file-based uh, data. But it's not meant to be loading a huge amount of data. It is for the reference data. Then we also have the macro that you can write or the modules that contain the macro that you are uh, using in your project. And in this case, I can go and see in packages, these are the two packages, the two libraries that we are using. This is the DBT, DBT utils uh, provided from the DBT creator Fishtown Analytics. And also we are using the DBT Vault library. And you can see now I'm using the revision 0.6 on the main distribution, but I also have uh, a pet project that I do with Postgres because it's just for me, so I want to keep everything local. Also because that's my own stock data. And I have also made my, per my fork, so I made a few adjustments to work with my local Postgres installation. But that's to give you the total flexibility that you can use libraries and also you can have your own, uh, develop internally your own library and you don't need to publish them. You just need to have them in a repository. So then you can also write the macro that are inside this specific project. And this is uh, uh, where the main development is done. So you develop your models. And we have neatly organized them in layer, like you saw in the architectural uh, view that I showed you before. So we have the staging model. So 
the ones that are responsible to get the incoming data and adapt it to our convention in the data platform. We have the model that create and load the data into the data vault. Then we have the business vault, so the model that manipulate the data to create uh, the business level concept. And last but not least, inside analysis, we usually have one folder for each data mark that we want to create. So we can then neatly organize. And of course, if we have conform dimensions that are used in many places, we can put them in an appropriate location. So let's start looking at some very simple. So you start wondering how much SQL and how much scripting. So there is practically a lot of SQL and not so much scripting. So that uh, the average person that knows SQL can actually start to understand and hopefully over time even help developing the data platform. If you look at this, this is the entry point in our platform. So we get the portfolio data that is loaded uh, from the incoming uh, file. And we just reference, because we have defined where the, the incoming file lands, we have defined as portfolio. And if you remember, it was one of the file that was loaded here. So one import. As we have this one, automatically this gets loaded into a table named portfolio, no wonder. And this is available as a reference. So the power of the tool comes from being able to reference models that can be table or view with these uh, uh, abstract references so that then dbt can join the dot and put the transformation in the correct order one after the other and also materialize the data in the current way with a view in a table with an incremental load so that we can just concentrate on describing in sql the transformation while uh, the tool is concentrated in the more practical aspect on creating the view, creating the table, loading, and all these uh, uh, not so funny uh, parts. And if we look at what we do in uh, our SQL, typically we like to write clear, readable code. So we get the source data for this uh, uh, model, and then we select and we create some technical fields. We do some name adaptation, and of course, we pick some other data that we want from the incoming data that we want uh, to push on. And on top of this uh, row, we be, that is materialized as a view, because by default, our staging layer is materialized as a view. And we do describe this in a very metadata-driven way, in the declarative way. So you see, we have the seeds, that are the CSV that are incoming, where we can define uh, if we have columns that we want to pick a specific uh, type, like in this case, I want to first talk, stop words, I want to keep seven digits. And I don't want to be double, for example, but I want to be or integer or a fixed precision number. And then we can describe some snapshot we will see that later. And our model, you see that we have neatly organized also this one. The staging layer is going to be materialized in a schema that is called STG and is going to be materialized as a view. Because this can be transient. We are just transforming data. This transformation will be materialized and stored in the data vault layer that will have a schema named DB and it's going to be materialized as a table. And some might be materialized just as a table, some might have an incremental table materialization because we are loading every day. So most of the, of the table here will actually have incremental table materialization. And then we have the business vault where we can materialize as a table or as a view. And uh, you can always mix and match. Here you can define a standard and the individual model can override the standard for its uh, folder. And then in the analysis, we try to keep a very agile approach. So we define 
uh, everything with view, the data mass, so that uh, they are totally virtualized until they don't perform uh, quickly enough. Okay, so let's go back to our models and let's see, we had the, the row, we have seen the row, so we look at the, the upper, so the following step in our transformation. So again, we see that uh, we had this very simple uh, reference. We reference the previous model. And then we start to use some of the library. In this case, we use dbtutils to with the, this macro because we want to do hashing. So in this hashed layer, as the name implied, we want to create all the hashes that will be uses, used down the line in the, the, our transformation, both primary key, foreign key, and hash diff, so the, the hash of the column that we want to check for changes. And this was very simple because in the end, our portfolio is here is a very simple thing. This, it's how it looks when you have something that is a little bit more complicated. It's a bigger table. So this is where the daily quote come in from this source system. So again, in this case, because these come from outside, so we don't even create the table, we can define that we have a source system called stop quotes that has a table called daily quotes. And again, the definition is based on metadata. You see that uh, we have defined that uh, we have a source named stop quote, and then it has tables, daily quote, this one I want to use, this one I have it there, but I don't want to yet use, so I just comment it out. And another thing that we will look later when we look at the business feature for each uh, source system, we can define uh, a freshness threshold, so warn if the data in the table of this system is uh, older than some amount. In this case, I have a very low SLA for the demo, so 30 days and error after 90 days. But you can define this both at this uh, uh, source system level, but you can also define it uh, at the individual table level. So going back to our daily quote, so we have picked in a very expressive way but also powerful because this is flexible. If I just want to change, I don't need to change the code here. I can just change uh, the reference uh, in my metadata. And then we use some very simple transformation, again, picking from another uh, source table, and then we do some very simple uh, uh, SQL. So we calculate which uh, data we want to pick, and then again we do the same in a very consistent way. So we calculate some technical fields, we pick the data that we want to uh, push on, and we also add up the field names. So I think this uh, uh, makes pretty clear how you can use simple enough SQL to build this uh, in progression. Uh, the transformation. And then when we go and look, for example, in how a link is built, we can look at the link and we can see that uh, we start to use more automation, more pattern. So we use even more uh, external library that provides us the best practice how to build a link model or how to build a satellite model, or in our case, the same, a hub. So I want to build a hub. In this case, our portfolio, we expect to have a full, the full set of portfolio always uh, in the latest uh, version available. So I can just load all of them every day. And so I don't really have to be concerned with incremental load. It's very simple. When I want to, or I need to, get concerned with incremental load, I just say in a metadata driven way, again, that I can say here in the model, or I could have said in the YAML model, 
this model has to be built incrementally, and then we can use some templating and say if it's incremental run, then use this model as the source. Otherwise, use this other one. And then we keep just using the tool, the marker, so that where we have embedded uh, the best way to build a link. And of course, then on top of that, we have built our layer and we can go and we can pick again using SQL. We have stored our uh, data, including all the possible correction, because maybe we had a wrong stop quote for a stock on a specific day that now has been corrected. So what I want to define, because for business, they want to use for most of their report the current best known uh, quotation and not something that was how it was known maybe one month ago. But we still have that and that can be used in another report where you have to audit and explain why maybe you had uh, reported a wrong portfolio value. But in this case, the business concept active daily quotes is built again in a very consistent and simple way. We reference the link, we reference the satellite, and of course we order on effectivity date, and then we get the latest one. And again, we pick the values that we want to push on. And these one are used in our uh, defining our fact. So in this case, you see how simple is the definition of a fact. And the same is more or less for portfolio value, because we have built here the same. We have built a portfolio content that has a value from value two. We have flattened that to have for each day the value uh, for each stock, for each portfolio, the amount for that. And then we have created the full portfolio value where we can see that we have used SQL to do very simple calculation. In this case, there is nothing fun fancy. It just uh, sums and product, but it could be even something more complicated. And uh, we will see that uh, all of this is clearly available also in the documentation and it's up to date uh, with the code that uh, your ATL is actually running. So I think that I have given you a quite uh, good overview of uh, how it looks like writing code uh, using dbt uh, to create your ATL. And so let's go back and check how our data load feels. Okay, looks like it executed. It took three minutes. I just took much more than that. But let's look, have a look at what the job was about. Hopefully we don't have the usual demo effect. No, it came in the normal time. So the job uh, is a pretty simple definition. So uh, these initial steps are done automatically. So it flows on the Git repository. It creates uh, a profile uh, to connect uh, to our selected database. It updates the dependency, the libraries we use. And then uh, dbt run, it runs the ATL. So it deploys and then executes the ATL. So what we see here is that uh, we have this ask, don't run everything. If we would do dbt run, it would run all the ATL, everything defined, but just the model that depend on the source, stop quote, and everything that comes after it. So what has happened is that we have run nine models out of 35. And here we have how much it took for each of them. And of course, loading the incremental data is the one that takes the longest. But then we also, after running the ATL, what we do, we also run the test. Because of course, we want to be sure that we don't track anything and that all also the test on the inter in referential integrity. So the keys are not null, the fields are not null, they are uh, as we expect. And then again, we just said, 
run the test that depend on the source stock word. So we had to run only 12 out of the 71 tests. And of course, this is a demo, this is a very small sample development, so the difference is not big. If I run all the ATL, it probably takes uh, five, six minutes, but you see that it start to make sense because most of the data platform, they are a mix of data that change often and data that don't change so often. So being able to run all the part that you need and being sure that that is up to date with the, what the code says is a really very important and very powerful feature. Then what we have done, we have asked to take a snapshot of a couple of tables, and then we have take a snapshot of the freshness of some other table that we have defined. And so, <coughs> sorry. So let's uh, go back and uh, let's see how the other jobs, for example, look like. So in this case, when I deploy to master, if I do a full run, I see, you see that uh, the initial steps are exactly the same. The difference is that here we also refresh uh, the reference data. So we load a few tables from our CS CSV. We do a full run. So we run all our models and we run all the tests. And then we take again a snapshot the freshness, and we also generate the documentation because we want to generate the documentation only when we do all a full run. You could do decide to do it even in every single load. It does, it's up to you to decide. So now that we know that we have loaded the, the data, let's go and check in our data platform that the data is actually there. So let's look in our source. Okay, yes, it is there. Is it in the satellite? Yes, it is there. And then let's look. Yes, we also have it in the fact table. So cool. Let's see if also our BI is able to load it now. So let's hit refresh. Cross our finger for having some reasonable, uh, quick enough response, yes. And you see that now we have loaded the data. And so I can also go and see if now Facebook has all the data up to the latest day. So let's go and see. And yeah, we have the data up to the latest date. So I think that this uh, has been a very simple uh, demonstration of how the platform can be used uh, to do uh, easy development in a, a very flexible and agile way, and also to run uh, the ATL that you need to run with the frequency that you want. So now what I want to do is go back uh, uh, to DBT and show you a few other topics. So first thing, what we use, of course, is a, a Git repository. So we have uh, our own uh, repository where we have stored our code. And I told you, you can use it uh, with the process in DBT Cloud, or you can use it normally in the usual way that you develop uh, with your uh, editor and a, a command line Git tool. In the end, they both end up in uh, doing a pull request and merging into the right branch that then you use inside your jobs. And if we look at the DBT, we have seen how we develop, we have seen what we have in the run history, and just let's take a very quick look. So how we define, you see that we have uh, another job that we have defined 
that is automatically run when a pull request is uh, uh, to be merged into master. And let's look at the definition of one job. So you see that defining a job is something that is really, really simple. You pick which environment you want to deploy to. In this case, we have picked CI. And then you define a runtime. In this case, uh, I have 10 minutes. And then you just write the dbt command that you want to be executed. And then you can pick if you want it to be executed on a schedule, using a webhook, on pull request, or only on a specific branch, or uh, you want to enable uh, being called to an API. And so you have the example request that uh, this is the URL that you can uh, use, and then this is uh, the SHA uh, the git commit that you want to be triggered, and then some explanation. So it's very easy to build uh, a new job, to run it, uh, or automatically or manually. So uh, in our case, we run a CI job uh, on a schedule because we want to always have fresh data in CI. And would I have a production for the demo? I am not even created a production environment. But should we have a production environment, we just require to have a new environment defined, that is the connection settings uh, to our Snowflake, and then a new job exactly like this, but that will deploy the code to our production. And then probably you want to run manually so that you know that you can trigger with a one button push a deployment uh, to your production environment. That's probably a better idea than having that automated. But if you want to push for continuous automation, you can do that too. So as the you can automate the build and deployment when you have a, a push uh, a emerge into master, you can do the same and also deploy to production. That's up, up to you. And then I want to show you uh, a couple of features that are also useful for the business users and your analyst. So the first one is the simplest of the two, is this source freshness. So the idea here is that you can define, and I have shown you uh, the YAML file with the defin metadata based definition, which table you want to snapshot for freshness and the threshold to say if the data is fresh enough you have a warning or the data starts to become a state. And of course, what you can do is that you can also define some alerts uh, if the data become uh, in a warning state or state, and the same alert you can define in a very straightforward way also, and you see here, notification, also for your jobs. So you just edit and you pick and put the check mark on what you want to be notified about. So I think that that's the reason why we really encourage to use uh, DBT Cloud. Even if it's, uh, uh, we don't get anything out of that, we just think that it's a, a very smart platform that take the problem of deploying things. So you don't really have set up anything, you just provide the connection credential and then everything is uh, easy to use for all your users, the developer, and also the business user. Because what I was showing you, so the freshness and also this documentation is available for your business user. So while the development, you have to log in and have a spe special access. This one is also available uh, to, for login but to other type of users that they cannot do development, but they can use the documentation and the freshness to do their own uh, work. So I start uh, uh, from showing you the lineage graph. So in this case, it is a pretty simple uh, platform that I have built for this demo. 
And I'm not even using a lot of that, or so definitely have not shown everything. But you see that uh, this creates a very simple to follow lineage graph that you can also reorganize if you have, if you want to show some uh, in a better way that makes more sense for your business. And it shows very clearly what are the source system that we are using. This one are the one that you remember I had source. And this is snapshot system. This is the stock report system. And then we are taking the daily quotes for these two different tables from the snapshot system. And of course, you can filter. It's very flexible. So if I want to see only uh, the dependency, how we calculate the fact daily quote, I can just say fact daily quote, and I just put a plus in front of it. And this way you have filter, but we you can also add tags in the metadata or in the configuration and inside uh, of each model. So you can filter on tags because it could be staging, uh, the overall staging, and then data vault, the business vault, or the specific data mart, or the specific concept. So you name, it's very flexible, but it's not only that, that here we can go and explore. So if we look at, for example, we have seen our import, portfolio so we can go and see this how it is uh, uh, imported we can see other like this one and what is good that, that beside the up-to-date column name the type we also see what test and run when on this table and on this field so this is something that we have defined with metadata and this is both for the data that we import, but it's also available also for all the other models. So in this case, you see what is the content of this model. You see the full, the source, and you see how it is expanded to uh, SQL. So you can actually copy and run this, and this is just a select. So no harm done, because all the logic to insert incrementally into uh, the satellite, it is generated on the fly by dbt. So if we want, for example, this is also useful because we want to know how we calculate the portfolio value, no problem. Let's go get that. And we see this in a more abstract and for me, easy to read, and also in the compiled version. I can just copy this one and run it. So let's take some more uh, risk in, in the demo and let's do this. And let's hope that we actually get it right. So this is very simple, very powerful for your business user that want to verify how things work. So, and then, of course, what you can also do is that you are not interested in all the graph, so you want to see the lineage graph only of this particular object, and you can see uh, the closest layer, or you can open it up, and you will see all the model that I used to generate it, and also the one that depends. And you see, the syntax is very, very simple, because in the end, this is the same. I don't want what is coming after, and I can just do that. I want it back, I just do this. So it is, uh, for me, a very powerful feature, and something that, it, because it's something that nobody really wants uh, to do, is something that easily uh, gets stale, and so it takes the both the asshole off of your developer uh, to do the documentation, but most importantly, gives you good usable documentation. 
because this is live. This corresponds to the uh, ATL that you are actually using. This corresponds to the views and to the table that you actually have in your data platform right now. So it is not something done last time a few months ago. So, sorry. So let's go back and I think that uh, I have shown you the main feature of uh, DBT, DBT Cloud, uh, that we can encapsulate uh, uh, the good practice and reuse the code in a very good way following software engineering best practice. And so uh, I would uh, uh, like to conclude this more practical part by just a quick tour of how this uh, looks in our data platform, this Snowflake. So what we have done, and this is a setup that can work for very simple cases, uh, or it's very good, for example, for development. So what we have created in this case, we have created a database, and then we have used this database both for multi-developer setup. So in this case, you see my initials are Z underscore BV. So underscore DV. So DV, BV, import, seed, SDG. These are the schemas that we have defined in our metadata. Add Z is a prefix that I have defined in my setup. So what is good is that we can use um, DBT to do multi uh, developer development. So we can use the same database, we can use the same source table and eventually even the same snapshot table, but we can have our independent uh, tables during development and also code under development because you see, this is mine, this is uh, Miguel, one of my colleagues, and then we probably have something also from William. So you can easily have multiple people working on the development side and not conflicting with each other, and everything is possible because we have these references. So when I go and look at the code, I'm not saying in exactly in which table. I am just saying, pick from this model, we are referenced a model, or we are referenced a source system. So in this case, the reference to portfolio will be my portfolio inside seed. Actually, it will be inside import because we have simulated. So it will be a z import dot portfolio, while it will be the correct schema uh, for my colleagues. So I can work independently, and we can develop independently. And then what we can have, what we have also here, that we also have used the same database to have a CI. So this is the common CI that gets built when I have run the job. This is also what now we are using to power the Power BI uh, dashboard. Of course, this could be just configured to be in another database and without a prefix. And then the same is for production. It could be just a set of schemas or it could be, and that's probably what I would do for production, to have its own database and probably have the schema without any prefix. But that's something that is easy to configure because it's just about metadata and your project setup. And it calls also for very easy following because you have, I have all of my schema organized in a neat way. And this is, for example, how I have decided to call the schema where I have developed the, this uh, uh, data mine. And of course, I can go and select. And another feature that if you don't want, for example, uh, to have to write, in this case, they are very simple uh, SQL, but here I am looking into the specific table. One other um, good functionality from DBT is that it can all also help you run 
SQL. So you can use this one or less with need. Let's create a new statement and I can just copy paste. And in this case, I, I don't need to fully qualify the table. In I am development, developing, so this is going to look, use my, the reference to my environment. So I can compile. And so this, you see, it will resolve to RZ months, RZ data vault. And of course, the source is the same because we have defined that the source is the same for everybody. And then I can even have the facility to run it directly for me. And uh, let's see, in my test data, I'm also missing American Airlines, and probably the dates are different than the one that we have in the CI that we have used uh, to show you the data today. So I think it's uh, very flexible, and it's uh, really calls for an agile way, way of working. So I hope that I gave you uh, a good overview uh, some realistic feeling of how it looks like um, to work with the DBT, building a data platform uh, that is uh, using data vault uh, architecture. But as you see, it's not strictly needed. A lot of the advantages come from the data vault uh, way of being reproductive, so continuously applying the same pattern in the same way, so it enables easy uh, encapsulation of the best practice inside Marco. So that's why we like Data Vault. But you could use any other architectural style, and we can still get a lot of benefits by using DBT, and in this case, probably not the DBT Vault uh, library some other library that we can develop so that we use the best practice that we decide to use. We honestly believe that uh, with this setup, building a data vault, data platform, is really so simple that there is no excuse not to do that. And uh, so let's start uh, our closing. So we begin uh, this uh, practical part of the demo with uh, this goal for our square box company. So, uh, did we succeed? How do you feel? Do you think that uh, we have fulfilled uh, the main goals uh, from this company? I think that uh, we have shown a very high level of automation, both in the process and in uh, the release. So. We have been just writing SQL with some markers, and if we would have time, if we would go uh, into the detail, I don't want to get too much technical. But uh, even looking at the markers, the markers are written again SQL and very simple uh, Jinja template that is really a simple templating. Uh, framework. And then I think that it's clear that we have shown uh, this audit ability because all the source data is stored as loaded from the source in the data vault, including the time when that we have received. You have seen that we have we can create and push one layer after the other all the metadata to have a low level uh, source and so tracking the lineage at the row level, we also have the transformation lineage and also uh, a good way to produce documentation for audit uh, reporting. And definitely, we have done almost everything by using Marco in a very simple way and mostly writing basic SQL so that uh, you can really uh, use and empower the people that already know SQL inside your organization. I showed you also that we have really uh, enforced some of the best practices, both on uh, how to build a data vault with the marker, 
uh, how uh, to do the code development, uh, including I having tests, including how you deploy uh, making or how you develop making pull requests, running a continuous integration system, and also how you deploy. And uh, I would say that in the end, all uh, these data platform become a very agile data platform because it's structured in a, a good software engineering way with clear boundaries between the different layers with a clear responsibility. And also it makes so that ingesting new data is really easy and quick because it's just uh, a mostly mechanical application of our best practice of the markers that are available so that you can really do it in a really short time. And then building the business board and the data mark, this is something that uh, it's used the data vault as a source, but it doesn't modify it. So again, you can have uh, empower uh, users that know SQL to build that and do be productive and develop quickly, also using virtualization by having view, you can easily change, explore what, uh, what comes out when you change your code. It's really called for very quick development, both on the ingestion of the data and also on the production of meaningful information out of the data that you have in your data warehouse. So I think that uh, uh, we had a good journey and I hope that uh, uh, you like uh, what we have shown. Uh, and of course, please look at the top right corner because uh, if you have liked that, uh, we would like uh, uh, to work uh, with you. And uh, I hope to hear many questions now or even offline after this event from many people getting in contact. So if you have uh, uh, some question, I think now it would be a good time to ask them to the platform so I can uh, try to answer you and show you what you want to see. Thank you. Thank you, you see. So you see, uh, I am based in Helsinki, uh, but we also have other uh, uh, location uh, here in Finland. And uh, of course we are available for traveling. And uh, personally, I've been traveling quite a lot uh, to Sweden in the past years. So it would be nice to hear more from you.
So let's see if uh, we get uh, uh, a few more questions. But uh, uh, in the meantime, I can, uh, let's say, make uh, a very high level recap. So uh, why we have picked this tool. So I am uh, a software engineer that has spent many, many years uh, in working with data. And what I've been really fighting for is to take software engineering into data warehouse world. And I have struggled because uh, many tools don't really allow a software engineering approach to developing uh, your ATL transformation. So when I have seen uh, DBT, I have taken it into use uh, to try out it work. And I have found that it's really, really powerful and gave me this ability uh, to use my software engineering best practice also to develop ATL that otherwise were developed in less than industrial way. And uh, on the other side, uh, I got in love with the Snowflake because it provides uh, this power to do what you need without having to uh, think upfront what all that uh, you might need, all the power that you want. It is very easy to use. It uses uh, uh, very standard SQL that uh, if you come from any system will just work as expected. And also it has some feature that make it unique by having the storage in an infinitely scal scalable uh, online storage system like S3 or Azure or Google, where you can store an infinite amount of data, it enables you to have not, not need to separate between the hot data that you want and the other data that you might not really need every day. So you can just cost effectively store there everything. And on the other side, you can scale it almost infinitely because again, on this online system, having the execution separated from the storage costs that you can use all the power you need when you need it. And putting this together, you really can create powerful transformation that work on tiny scale and on huge scale. Uh, data platform. And uh, the final, for me, uh, reason to use such data platform is because it's cross cloud. You can move your data between one and the other, and you can easily share the data or between different parts of a bigger enterprise group, or even with your customer. And now with uh, also the marketplace, you can actually even consider monetizing the data that you have. So I think this is a quite unique platform that uh, doesn't add cost, doesn't add complexity, just gives you uh, good value and possibilities. So that's why I am really in love with these two tools. And finding the DBT Vault library that has really enabled uh, us to get even quicker into the uh, using data vault architecture, uh, it really uh, pushed us to make take this approach and productize it so that uh, we can deploy it to customer in a very uh, quick way, uh, in a, um, using experience, uh, our experience on how to pick the best practice on how to do all the little manual tasks uh, that you need, uh, like uh, picking some naming convention, uh, organizing the layers, and so all the decisions that we have already taken many times, and actually avoid losing all this time to figure them out, try, come back, and so on. So I hope that uh, it's been really uh, inspiring for you, as it has been inspiring for me, uh, building uh, this data platform. So uh, thank you very much. And one other question that I got is uh, if there is a large DBT community on the internet. Yes, there is. There is also a huge Slack channel. Uh, so if you go to DBT uh, web pages, you can also join uh, the DBT Slack. 
and you can have both community support that is pretty good and uh, quite immediate and of course you can also have support uh, uh, from the creators so, so fishtown analytics but that's one of the reasons uh, why i pick and use uh, an open source tool because it has to have a critical mass that is not something ephemeral this is a, a product that has a, a big enough company behind that has got uh, uh, recently, last April, some very serious funding from VC. So it's something that we are going to hear even more. And uh, there is also already a very big and sizable community. So we have the guarantee that uh, this is uh, here to stay and we just improve. It's not something that is going away. So I'm also texting because I think it's uh, easier to interact because we don't have this 30 second delay. <laughs> but uh, I'm also uh, looking for some question that might uh, uh, grant a longer answer. So in the presentation, uh, I use 16.1 because I started uh, before they released uh, 17. But uh, it is possible also to uh, port it uh, to 17. I just have uh, concentrated in uh, doing this development uh, while I also had uh, some holidays where, when they released 17. So uh, I would say that uh, it's not a main problem. Uh, there should be no big use of the main change they did in 17. That is where uh, you use, uh, you can define variables because personally, I have, uh, this is the way we use all the libraries. For example, it's a very opinionated way. It's our way of using it. Uh, for example, the creator of uh, uh, DBT Vault, they prefer uh, to define variables in the metadata files and then use the variable uh, to call uh, the, the markdown. Personally, I find cleaner just to put the values inside the file that defines the table. So, when I use a marker, I know uh, the values that I am passing. Unless uh, there is some need uh, to switch the value from the metadata, I prefer to just define that and remove one indirection layer. Because when you have a big deployment, you really have a huge amount of uh, metadata and it gets, if you have everything in one or a few files, it's easy to get lost. So having each definition in its own file that still you have to create a file to call the macro. For me, it's easier to get to and to read. But uh, that's personal uh, preference or let's say company-wise preference. I see some more questions coming, so I'm really happy to answer uh, to all the comments or questions that you really have.
So one interesting question from UC. So how do you ingest the data? So the DBT is concerned uh, with the transformation. So the data has to be uh, available uh, for your data platform to be usable. So if uh, you have, uh, let's say, Postgres, Oracle, database on-premises, there is no way that you can really read it unless you find a way to collect, connect it uh, with the uh, Snowflake. So if you can have an external table, that's no problem. You can shred it from that. So you define that as a source. But the typical use case is that uh, you have the data that is uh, available or in a file like S3, then you can use a normal SQL, so you can define with dbt uh, the import, so you can select uh, from a stage where you have those files and insert into a table that is going to be your source table, and you start your transformation from that table, and then uh, you just use it normally, or you can define external table that go and fetch the data uh, wherever Snowflake is able to go and get it. So uh, the general answer is that anyway, dbt is concerned with the transformation that can be expressed with the, with the SQL that your data platform allows you to do. Then uh, Snowflake in that sense is also a good platform because allows you to use it to start uh, collecting and transforming data from a different range of system, not only on tables that are already inside Snowflake. So the other typical use case is that customers have uh, data coming from their marketing activities uh, or CRM system and so on, and they use uh, some of these uh, data loaders uh, uh, that exist. They have uh, uh, already uh, adapted, uh, they have created it, a software as a service uh, uh, platform that connects to your system, so your Google or your CRM system, and uh, uh, queries uh, the APIs, and then load the data in some destination table. In this case, you point those to load the data in some schema, uh, like we had this source uh, uh, schema in our Snowflake, and uh, your data will be available there. That is going to be your source for the transformation and from there you use dbt to do all the upfront transformation and there you start to build your layering so the row staging hash staging and so on uh, going up to the fact table okay you see uh, I hope your pasta will be good. I also, you probably got a couple of bling because uh, those were some SMS from my wife that uh, she wanted to know <laughs> uh, if I am coming or not. Uh, she's probably not aware of the timing of my uh, workshop. But that's the life uh, in this uh, uh, remote uh, system. So we have multiple things going on at the same time. But uh, I think that uh, the time has come now uh, to end uh, my presentation. Uh, I don't recall exactly uh, the timing that we had for uh, this lot, but I see that uh, we don't have other questions. So if you have more questions, I'm here uh, to answer them. But otherwise, I, I thank you again, you, and I hope uh, to get uh, uh, in contact with many of you uh, because uh, I'm very happy uh, to share what we have been doing and uh, help you get started uh, in doing better use of your time developing ATL in a, a proper way as a proper software engineering process. So thank you again.